for a studio. Yeah, I'm going to start record because that's the new set. Do you need me to record my end? No, no, we're good. We're good. You sure? Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm in the exact same boat. I mean, this, this whole uh, enterprise of becoming a podcaster has been a long uh, line of things that begin with the, the phrase, I really should know how to dot, dot, right. dot. Yeah. It's kind of a Make-A-Wish Foundation type vibe. But anyways, let's start the show. Um, on a world spinning its way to damnation amidst the fear and despair of a broken human race who is left to fight for what's good and pure. It's the Night Rule Podcast. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, rulers. We have a very special guest. I've been very excited about this all day. I've been choosing my intro song and outro song very carefully, jumping through a lot of different options, which I know means I'm very excited. We're, uh, we're so pleased to be joined by Nando Vila. Welcome, Nando. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of Jacobin and, and so many other places. Um, Woke Bros, I've been listening to a lot lately, really enjoying your work there. Um, but uh, you're, kind of, you're kind of like almost like a media mogul, wouldn't you say? No, I would not. I would absolutely not say that. Um, the, you know, media moguls have actual power. I just am on right. a lot of media, which is, uh, uh, which is different. It just means I'm overexposed and overstretched. <laughs> well, I, I suppose that's one way of looking at it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's really hard to, I mean, it's really hard to avoid the topic of the day, which is, you know, a, a huge escalation, probably the worst violence we've seen in years in uh, Palestine and Israel. Um, you know, I think there's probably a lot of people in academia teaching things like media classes, asking themselves like, what the fuck do I say to my students in class tomorrow? We're talking about like media studies and we're seeing this like catastrophe unfold on our front pages like every morning. Um, that's got to be kind of a tough position to be put in, I think, trying to actually explain how the media handles something like this, because it's been such a Gordian knot. Am I right? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that it's been interesting this time around. I mean, I've been working in the media since 2009, I want to say 2008, when I, gra I graduated college 2008. Um, and I've been working in media since then. So I it's been a remarkable change in that. I mean, you know, every few years, there's there's something going on in Israel, Palestine. And uh, it's been interesting to see this time around, I feel like the media treatment of it is somewhat different um, than it was say in 2014, the last time there was major violence when it was just like, you know, fully hegemonic pro-Israel propaganda, wall to wall, no questions asked. Anyone who challenges that is kind of just seen as ridiculous or, or worse, you know, um, this time, like, for example, even kind of liberals who I would criticize on a million other issues kind of put a, a pretty uh, forceful statement out, like John Oliver in his segment uh, on Sunday and his latest show on Israel Palestine was surprisingly, surprisingly pro-Palestinian, surprisingly harsh on Israel. Um, you just would not have seen that seven years ago. Um it's an interesting thing. I think it's a. It's, I think it's an, a microcosm as to where the left is in today's day and age, in which the left has enough of self-organization and self-awareness and broad-based appeal to puncture certain conventional wisdoms that previously were um, kind of sacred and untouchable, while at the same time being so far removed from power that the actual levers of power are more as reactionary as ever. So, you know, the Biden administration, nominally uh, the left of center administration in the United States is just like, yeah, Israel, do whatever the fuck you want. Just murder mm. those bastards. Who gives a shit? Yeah. You know? um, and the left has no ability to stop that. <laughs> um, because that's the continuation of a long process too. It's actually, it's interesting that you say that because that's my thinking exactly actually in some ways, because while you know, within the, the mainstream of the kind of media sphere that's pro-Israel, or or at least that was more mainstream and kind of a little more neutral, say, 10, 20 years ago, like if you read The Guardian 20 years ago, you would have gotten a much more sympathetic slant towards the Palestinian cause that kind of did become moderated more and more over time. Like, it seems like each time things have kind of gotten downgraded, whereas now I, I go and read the BBC, for example, and it just seems like Israeli propaganda just full out. I mean, it just, it honestly just has gotten, there's there's just no chink in the armor at all. It's just full board. But at the same time, as you say, you know, on in independent media and even in the halls of power with politicians and whatnot making statements, there's there's a more critical atmosphere. So maybe, maybe the fact that 
any kind of neutrality has really been lost in that kind of core media sphere has motivated people that you know what like if i don't speak out nobody will yeah a little bit no i think you're right that if you zoom out far and like if you if you if you apply the lens wide enough and include say the late 80s or the early 90s the subject of israel palestine was not um was not as one-sided in the media coverage like it was much more you know even like i mean that's what everyone's talking about that george hw bush uh, yeah. made usa to israel conditional on them not doing any more settlements i think there was just like a dramatic swing to the right on on foreign policies uh from Clinton to the Bush, you know, Bush Jr. Um, through Barack Obama, that it was just like, mm. um, even Barack Obama's like incredibly tepid, like, please don't do settlements, guys, <laughs> was sure. seen as like, was seen as um, uh, just a, a horrible heresy uh, mm. by mm. by so many. Mm. Um, but, um, and, and, you know, and, and Ben Rhodes, his, his foreign, you know, top foreign policy advisor, who was seen as like, way out on the fringes of kind of acceptable discourse just for being a little um, bit dovish yeah this is a slight just the slightest yeah. bit dovish um but i think that the you know the period be, you know starting starting with the, especially with the bush administration in which like the american media just became kind of fully enmeshed with the national security apparatus um and as the politics of israel changed to swing dramatically to the right um, yeah. I mean, is, you know, Israeli politics were not as fervently reactionary as they are now, mm -hmm. um, or they or as they have been in the last decade or so. Um, so I, I mean, I think the media kind of just went along with as they as the media always does the media, you know, the, in this country, especially like they just go along with whatever the hegemonic uh, position is um, from with, within the halls of power. So you know, you're right that if you swing out far, like wide enough, like to the early nineties or, or, or then like it would, it's very different, but like, mm. it is diff, it is the, the narrative isn't sticking as much now. And mm. the reason why I know that is because they're clinging to like, kind of like desperate woke identity politics. I mean, the Barry Weiss thing, you know, like my, you know, lived experience is not being heard or whatever <laughs> um, mm. <laughs> on this issue. And that's just like, that to me, when you're, when you're appealing to that kind of thing, then that means you're in a position of weakness. Mm. Yeah, I mean, when you have to resort to really like well-worn, just completely overused tropes as well. Um, I don't know, I, I feel as though it's possible, I mean, it's interesting because yeah, the media has become even more locked in. And I think I think you're right when you when you indicate that, that has more to do with kind of the real politics of, of the global security apparatus and, and you know the day and age we're living in where really you're looking at the United States really trying to become a preeminent power in Central Asia and Asia at large. And like they don't give a shit other than about anything besides that, really, when it comes to Israel. Like Israel is a hugely important strategic ally to them. Fuck yeah. everything else, really. There's no moral questions. There's no questions of history, camaraderie, uh, mutual love between peoples or anything like that. Um, and it's it's really like, I think that's kind of apparent to people now to a certain extent. And I also think what's apparent to people is that the media has kind of been bought off. Like, like let's be fair here. The media has gone through some incredibly trying times over the last several decades. I mean, let's just start with the war in Iraq. Huge hit to its credibility. Massive huge hole just blown right on the side of the ship. It's puttering along and you have things like the financial collapse. You have things like, I really feel like it's kicked into high gear with Russiagate and all this, all, all the, and Comey and all this yeah. build up for all this shit that went fucking, no, a whole bunch of fluff. The Steele dossier nowhere. and the fucking P-tape, the amount of people who like took that seriously. I mean, that yeah. was very obviously bullshit. Um, so like, no, maybe I, mean, I think you're right. Media, I mean, it's, yeah. It's not surprising that the media's uh, trust ratings are lower than they ever have been. Mm. You know, it's for all those reasons that you just pointed out. I mean, the, the media's tr the level of public trust in the media is lower than ever before. Yeah. It's interesting, though, because like my level of trust in who I view to be like, quote unquote, legitimate media or certainly like on the spectrum is like totally different than some of the psychos out there. In the halls of Congress, for example, let's just look at one uh, Mr. Tom Cotton, who's just like making these statements like the Associated Press, you know, the intrepid reporters had no way of knowing their office was right next to Hamas. It's just like, dude, like, do you think that motherfucker like has ever like read more than two or three Associated Press stories in his fucking goddamn life? Well, That's question no, number I mean, one. Well, that reminds me, there's a there's a there's like a classic Alex Perrine uh, essay talking about um, the sort of right wing media grift in that 
in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, the conservative movement uh, really came into its own by building a, um, a series of independent media, starting with uh, talk radio, right wing talk radio, which was huge in, uh, in, in the sort of taking of power in American politics of the conservative movement, and, uh, and then followed, followed that with Fox News. And there was always a sense that the people in power in the Republican Party all they read the Wall Street Journal and the Weekly Standard, and you know those publications kind of told them the real shit, the shit that went on in the news. And then the all the rest of the stuff was just for these idiot roofs the that we need to right. sell, the base that we need to sell on this like kind of unpopular agenda. Um, and that what ends up happening is that you know those kind of old timey conservatives, and I don't want to like valorize, I don't want to do like the liberal thing of like, you know, remember when the Republican Party was sane or whatever? Like, no, no, no. No, we're not they doing were that cynical. Either, don't worry. Yeah. No, yeah. They were cynical bastards, but um, Well, like you know, the honest... reason Trump, like there's something that preceded Trump, for fuck's sakes. I mean, what, course, what yeah. fucking primary did Trump win to become president, right. for fuck's sakes? Like, give me a break. But the, what, the point that, the broader point that he makes is that the inmates have taken over the asylum in which now the people who are in power in the Republican Party all read the insane, like all, like they, they read Breitbart and fucking... Mm you know, uh, right wing fucking watch and uh, whatever the fuck, like insane uh, right wing media, like they're all just like steeped in it. Uh, and yeah. so and, and they no longer trust even things like the Wall Street Journal or the or the Weekly Standard or things like that, which were evil and awful in many ways, but um, at least were kind of semi reality based. So, mm. um, you know, that's that's a huge part of it. But I mean, like you said, the mainstream media's failures like the mainstream media has no one else to blame but itself. Um, sure. yeah. um, I mean, you know, the, this Russiagate nonsense was just so, uh, if, to anyone who had worked in the news industry, I mean, at least to me, I had, I had worked in newsrooms um, and things like that. Like, and you, if you understand a little bit of how, of, of how a news story kind of comes to being, you know, how it kind of germinates itself from, from a, you know, source to the pages of the New York Times, like just obviously bullshit like just obviously bullshit and like every single one of those stories especially the most explosive ones fell apart within within weeks of of publication and then of course no one noticed that they would just move on to the next one um things like the steel dossier which was just so obviously bullshit trump the one thing we know about trump is that he's a fucking germaphobe you think someone's gonna let some fucking prostitute in russia pee on him like yeah. It's like the last thing he would ever do. He's a depraved, evil man. Um, oh, but he's, 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 done, he's done much more depraved shit than that. When you hear the real stories, they're fucking horrifying. Like the ones where he would, uh, my favorite, and I always want to tell this to evangelical Christians that voted for him, was that he would brag about how the best thing in the world was sleeping with another man's wife. And yeah. Then he would, and then he would record a conversation he'd have with a guy about going upstairs to with some young ladies, some prostitutes or whatever, record that, play it for that guy's wife. And then try and sleep with her being like, look, your yeah. husband's not being faithful. Like that's a, fu that's a fucking monster of a human being. I'm sorry. Yeah. But yeah. No. Yeah. But Pete, but he's a germaphobe. Yeah. The germaphobe. He's not going to yeah. get peed on. You know, that's the last thing he's ever going to do. <laughs> yeah. Well, to be honest, even under normal circumstances, it's probably not the best. Let's be honest. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, I mean, no, we're not, we're not going to kink shame on this podcast. Of course. No, that's uh, true. If it's your thing, Hey, let your freak flag fly. That's yeah. what I always say. This is night rule for God's sake. Um, now the question is though, like, where, where do we go from here? Because I feel as though, you know, on the one hand you have a local, uh, Israeli government, but again, it's a government like any other government. I don't see why people have this like fealty to Benjamin Netanyahu, Netanyahu when he can't even like scrap, like put together a stable coalition himself inside Israel. Yeah. And, I, and to me, it's shocking. Like, it's one thing to say, okay, we're going to forgive all these human rights abuses because, um we're pro-israel but it's like are we all seriously just going to be pro like politicians because they're because they're an israeli politician like have we forgotten what politics is and who politicians are it's really bizarre to me that people just like somehow think benjamin netanyahu is like some guy of significance you know other than a purely self-interested operator like yeah. come on i mean i mean i think that you know you're right and it is true that benjamin netanyahu has not been able to um, secure a sort of stable majority in the last couple of years. But the, the, the sad reality is that also his main rival, Benny Gans, in a lot of these elections is just like believes all the same shit he does. Like there's no, there's no real left opposition. It's like, are we like foam 
coming at the mouth uh, reactionary right wingers, or are we just kind of like slightly less foamy at the mouth reactionary right wingers? Right. Like, I mean, that that's the that's the political divide uh, in Israel today. I mean, it's like there is no meaningful left opposition. And again, I'm not like I'm not like some expert on Israeli politics. I know there's the very kind of broad strokes about it, but from what I understand, there is no there is no left. It's 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 right or it's extreme right or very far right. <laughs> Those yeah. are your two options. That's true. The dog is admonishing you for your statement. Sorry about that. That's no, no, okay. Elvis. <laughs> Wonderful name. Yeah, I think I think I heard him crashing uh, woke bros recently. It was charming. But um, it's a she. Don't misgender her. Oh, sorry, sorry. Not terrible, Elvis. You, you threw me off with the with the name Elvis. Well, she's gender bending. You know, uh, you know, she's very she's very modern and progressive. I think she wants us to also like switch to a lighter tone. So let me ask you this. Is it true or is it not true that you have in your life organized a Mark Antony concert? Because I have to hear about that. It is true. And it is not Mark Antony. Mark Antony was uh, Cleopatra's lover. This is Mark Anthony with the T Anthony. with the TH. Right, 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 yeah. right, right, right. Um, former former husband of 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 one J Lo. I did. It was this was in two thousand. I want to say this was two thousand eleven. 2011, I want to say, either 2011 or 2010. I don't remember. It was in Cartagena, Colombia. Um, and it was a sort of benefit concert um, to benefit a, a series of kind of conflict resolution nonprofits or whatever. It was called the Healing Power of Music. Um, and um, we did a music video with Carlos Vives uh, around the country in Colombia. And and we organized this this concert with Mark Anthony in, in the middle of a plaza in Cartagena, um, which if you haven't been there or if your listeners haven't been there is an amazing place, 100% worth going. It's a perfectly preserved colonial city in mm -hmm. Colombia, and um, in a country that's notoriously beautiful itself, right? Like what's the Colombian saying? Like the like like God was so jealous when they made Colombia that that's why he sent evil men or something like along those lines. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. that. That sounds about right. Yeah, mm. it is a very beautiful country. Uh, also, like very, you know, reactionary in many ways and very violent. But um, yeah, um, yeah I, I, I've been to Colombia a million times, um, worked there. And yeah, I did a that was a that was a crazy experience. I mean, I, I, I had no idea what I was doing. It was kind of like uh, I was kind of like Wayne and Garth in Wayne's World, too. You know, if you book them, they will come. We weren't like exactly sure. And Mark Anthony was going to show up up until like the very last second. Uh, wow. All kinds of problems with like JLo and her rider and like the kind of things that we needed to do to get her um, to come and things like that. Like it was just, it was, it was an interesting experience. Like when, when you, when you would characterize people who are on their way or at people that are at a Mark Anthony concert, I mean, is there a group that you can imagine is like more, keen to just kind of have a good safe enjoyable time and listen to some great fucking pop music like it seems to me like it would be the most chill show but also just super fun and also energetic well mark anthony uh you know uh, maybe uh, certainly in the modern era the greatest salsa singer uh uh certainly of, of the modern era like i mean he had a few he had a few crossover hits in the early 2000s in sort of american uh pop music but in terms of kind of just your everyday salsa genre, he's 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 maybe the best. And so a Mark Anthony concert is a lot of fun. And he's an incredible performer uh, and a great singer, just like a, a really, 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 really talented singer. Tiny little guy, little guy like this big, uh, yeah. probably weighs 110 pounds. And uh, he uh, but he can he can belt it out. He's got an incredible voice. So most of them, most of his tracks i mean he has some ballads obviously like some romantic ballads and he has his his crossover hits like i need to know and things like that but but most of his songs are kind of uh dance salsa so like the the, the vibe at the concert was very festive and he's he's, he's much of, like people don't probably appreciate how much of a big deal he is like throughout latin america right like if you go to like, yeah. any club in latin america you're going to hear like five six mark anthony songs on oh yeah good night just yeah. as a matter of course, right? Yeah. Vivir mi vida is going to be at every wedding, you know, you ever go to with Spanish speaking people, 100%. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, he's a big deal. Like I said, he, maybe the greatest salsa singer of the modern, like of the last 30 or 40 years. So at some point, I'll learn how to say his name properly, I'm sure. But I'm also such a big fan of the historical Roman figure as well. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of hard. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're both super cool to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, it, it's just interesting to talk about because I feel as though there's a lot of uh, cultural kind of lost knowledge vis-a-vis -vis, like going out in a group and like doing shit and having fun. Yeah. Like, I, don't, I don't know how much of that is going on in L.A., um, not a what's it's not even there's not a lot of that going on in LA even in the best of times so mm. um LA has a horrible nightlife in my opinion maybe I'm biased because I come from Miami which has an incredible nightlife I'm although sure it it's does. been slightly Vegasified um but um yeah uh, Miami is becoming like the Vegas of, of the east coast okay um, hold on we gotta stop there um, so first of all you're from Miami yeah. you're my Miami's yeah. favorite favorite son voted most, ha most yes. handsome most likely to succeed whatever year it was, yeah. I don't know, 1993. So like tell people, cause like, I think, you know, I've never been to Miami, you know, I've traveled throughout the mm. States a bit. I, you know, I know, a, I know a little bit about it, but, but for someone who just does not appreciate the cultural significance or the milieu of Miami, a place like Miami, which is really, you know, people describe it as like almost a European city inside America. Is, well, it, is, I, it, is it like in terms of the multicultural aspect and the, oh, the, yeah. the diversity of people you'll see there from, Obviously, also, you know, native Spanish speakers, but also like a lot of Europeans themselves are just there all the time, right? Yeah, I mean, Miami, there's no, there's no like white people brought, like, I mean, obviously there's white people, but there's no like wasps in Miami. Well, Miami, you're either uh, Latin, European, Black, or Jewish. There's no like wasps. The wasps, which used to live and dominate Miami um, society, all left uh, essentially after 1980 uh, when there was the twin... The summer of 1980 in Miami is like a very fascinating summer that people don't really know about, but there was two things that happened. One of them was something called the McDuffie riots in which like a black man was killed by police um, and like beaten to death. Uh, and uh, they basically tried to cover it up by crashing his car and saying he died in a car accident. And then the, the trial was moved from Miami to Tampa uh, where a young prosecutor named Janet Reno uh, failed to wow. uh, reach a conviction for the for the white officers after an all white all male jury um, acquitted them of all charges, despite the fact that two or, I think two or three of the officers admitted that they that they killed him with their bare hands, but tried to cover it up by um, by like crashing his car into a wall repeatedly and say he died in a car accident. So that um, that decision unleashed a series of race riots in Miami in 1980, which were kind of a precursor to the Rodney King riots, like very violent, you know. Uh, stores burning, you know, people riding in the back of pickup trucks with shotguns protecting their property and things like that. While at the same time, there was something called the Mariel Boatlift, which if you watched Scarface, um, was when Fidel Castro uh, kind of emptied the jails of Cuba and 100,000 Cubans came in in one summer um, in a city of about a million people. So um, race riots on the one hand, bunch of Cuban criminals coming in on the other hand, the white people were like, fuck this, I'm out of here. And so they all left to Fort Lauderdale the, the in Broward County, the, the sort of count, the adjacent county, um, and left Miami to sort of the- Now I, now uh, I understand why Fort Lauder Lauderdale is synonymous with whiteness. I never really got that yes. before. Yeah, okay. That is why. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so Miami is an interesting place. Miami is, is very much like a, a Latin American city, you know, I would say. Yeah. Uh, and uh, very fun place to grow up. Very, very fun place in general. Um, very peculiar place. It's unlike any other place in, in the United States. There's nothing quite like it. it has many flaws, um, but it has a lot of virtues as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think something like, two thirds of the population of Miami, I'm, I'm like probably misquoting the exact number, but something like two thirds of the population of Miami don't have English as a first language, you know? Mm. Um, no, I mean, I've heard you can go to all kinds of restaurants there and you'll try and speak English and they'll be like, no, no English, it's no English here. Yeah. But I mean, like, what the fuck? Like, if you go, if you go to a place that just speaks those languages, I, I personally don't think you have any right to say, hey, you should speak my language. It's like, motherfucker, like you went to the place where people speak this shit, like. <laughs> Yeah, even if I, mean, it is, I think even if it is in yeah. America and you have this some some have some kind of like pseudo, you know, watered down white nationalist idea that you go, oh, you're in America, you should speak English. It's like, well, first of all, if you wanted that, America shouldn't have conquered parts of Mexico, motherfucker. Yeah. Like this. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Or uh, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and and the yeah. Philippines from Spain. But uh, oh, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, it is probably true that you're better. You're you can live more comfortably in Miami only speaking Spanish than only speaking English. Like if you only speak English and can't speak any Spanish, like every single store you walk into, every single restaurant you walk into, the first thing people say, like, 
Hola, ¿cómo estás? You know, le puedo ayudar. And you're like, wait, what? I don't, I don't know what you're saying. You're like, oh, I'm sorry. And then they switch to English. You know, that's mm -hmm. the, the, the default is kind of Spanish for, yeah. for a lot of places. Um, and also, to, 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 like the nightlife and like the cultural scene and like the vibrancy in terms of like, you know, if you're walking down the street in Miami on a summer day, you know, wearing your best, looking to get into some trouble, it's, it's probably one of the best places you could be. I'm oh, yeah. curious. I'm curious though. Like, why do you say it's becoming Vegas fight? Are they turning it into Miami land? Is it becoming like a theme park version of itself and shit? Yeah, I mean the 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 sort of um, the EDM revolution has uh, uh, Miami has become Miami has become kind of one of the global EDM capitals uh, mm. with things like Ultra Music Fest and Winter Music Conference and things like that. Uh, the massive clubs, uh, which I mean Vegas has, I mean Vegas used to be in the mob days in the glory days, <laughs> it was very much like a gambling place. Now it's like gambling is a small part of their business, and like the nightclubs mm. really dominate. Um, uh, like the, if you look at the, the revenue for, I don't know, something like the Cosmopolitan, which has Marquee, which I think at least this was at least the case a few years ago, Marquee was the most profitable nightclub in America. Um, that is their main business these days is the, I mean, those things are every night are just fucking printing money. Yeah. Um, and so Miami has opened up a series of massive nightclubs um, which kind of complement this mm. reputation that it has as a capital of, of electronic dance music um, through things like Ultra and Winter Music Conference. But, you know, Live is like a massive, I think of the, of the 10 most profitable nightclubs in America, eight are in Vegas and the other two are in Miami. And I think this was like a few years ago and I'm sure it's changed. And like, maybe now it's like six are in Vegas and four are in Miami. But like of all the clubs, quote unquote, in America, like they can't even hold a candle in terms of their size and ability to generate profit than the ones in Vegas and Miami. Um, now, are those people club who are fly, flying in and driving in? Yeah. To go to those no, big team. No, it's definitely fly, yeah. flying in because you can't really drive in from anywhere in Miami. Yeah. Miami's kind of very isolated. I mean, the closest other major city is Tampa, I guess. Um, but yeah, mostly, mostly flying in from all over the world. I mean, all over Latin America, all over America, and all over Europe. Um, it's kind of like right in the middle. Um, but there's a there's a nightclub that opened up in Miami. I want to say like eight or nine years ago, called Eleven. And Eleven, I, I like I'm so shocked that more people don't know about it because it's just, it is like one of the most remarkable places on the planet. The people who founded Eleven basically came up with this innovation in which they merged massive massive nightclubs with like major DJs, major acts. You know, like every night it's like David Guetta or Little John or whatever the fuck Ti, whatever. You know, like every single night with a strip club. So it's this massive, massive club, multiple rooms or whatever, plus there's strippers there. Plus it's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It never closes. It literally never closes. You can eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner there mm -hmm. while like clubbing hardcore. Um, and, you know, that's just, that's just what, Kind of Miami has become. It's always been a great nightlife. I mean, it's you know, LA, for example, which has a terrible nightlife. Uh, everything closes at 2 a.m. by law. Um, Miami, everything always stayed open very late. There was like late night clubs, like space, which went on to like fucking 3 p.m. in the afternoon from the previous night. Um, and um, but the sort of massive club thing has really taken over. Um, it's mm. become such a huge part of of the local economy it's only getting bigger they also even like there's a big movement to pass um you know legal gambling in miami like uh, i think it was voted down by the voters but they're still going to try it. they're going to try to overturn it they're going to try to build like massive casinos in miami they're going to turn it into the vegas of of the east coast mm. after trump ruined atlantic city <laughs> right as with so much else do you miss trump at all i mean i've heard some people say just as like a freak show and for like entertainment value i know we've kind of pulled gun gun we've been pulled into the lull of like a, a calm sleepiness that we're just getting ready for brunch we don't really want to think about it anymore it's fine if we bomb whoever overseas just let us get back to our daytime yeah. tv but on, on a certain level like trump was extremely entertaining yes Trump is the greatest comic uh, of our time. I mean, he's funnier. Like, you know, SNL could never make fun of Trump. Like the, the Alec Baldwin uh, impression of, of Trump on it's SNL. Half as funny was, as Trump himself, yeah. Yes, because you, you can't be funnier than Trump. Like you can't be funnier than him. He's too funny, so you therefore you can't make fun of him. You know what I mean? Um, 
I do miss the entertainment value. Um, whenever he pops up every once in a while and, you know, ranting at some wedding or something in Mar-a-Lago, I'm like, mm. oh, that's, <laughs> I kind of miss him. Um, what I don't the way, miss- The way he does the things with the weddings, man, to like own a wedding it's amazing. and then show up to, like literally it's apparently like every single wedding and then like kiss the bride and do all this creepy shit. Like- It's amazing. Unbelievable. Um, so what I don't miss about Trump is just how fucking crazy he made the libs. You know, I mean, that was to me always the the one of the more under underrated left arguments for Biden, you know, was uh, these libs, man, we can't go another four years with with Trump because like they're literally going to like drive us call crazy. Um, you know, with point. Biden, a lot of the sort of insane liberal shit, especially around Russia, but, you know, everything mm -hmm. that kind of came out of that was just like mm, mind-numbing to me I, like i hated that shit and well, there was I mean, just were, no room yeah. for anything there was just there no were, room to breathe they were primed because liberalism has been such a like wizened husk for so long as well you know it was like it was a dried out desiccated little disgusting expired bran flake that just needed the slightest touch to like make it light completely on fire and then it got trump which would is like a thousand billion times what it would normally need to have its hair lit on fire you know yeah like, like if we could, they'd get their hair lit on fire if, if like someone didn't have like a proper like tone, wasn't yeah. properly respectful before. And then you have someone coming along telling the world he's going to grab it by the pussy and shit. Right. I just, I, I very quickly into the Trump, like I was a little, I was definitely afraid when Trump kind of like won. I was like, holy shit, you know, like it's such a destabilizing oh, yeah. um, sensation of having this like obvious idiot, you know, on, on so many levels, like in the seat of power, the most powerful thing in the world. Like that's kind of, it gives you a sense of vertigo, but I very quickly realized, um, say four, four to six months into the Trump administration, that he could really do, he couldn't do that much damage. Mm. You know, like, was he really worse than George W. Bush? I would argue no. Mm. He was rhetorically more ridiculous, which is saying something, but um, he was like rhetorically more ridiculous and kind of like kept everyone on high alert. Mm. But in terms of like actual shit, it was your semi run of the mill, just kind of awful empire that america is and has mm. been for a long time mm. um he didn't really change that much that meaningfully Absolutely. so but what happened was because of the rhetorical kind of insanity of it all and the sort of heightened sense of of drama every single day liberals violated tons of their own standards norms mm. um procedures that you know i think are important and you know let's like going back to the media like a lot of their journalistic um standards just went out the window whenever oh, out the window for sure well because assange switched sides obviously as well was a big yes. thing for them and then also just like becoming like even more hawkish like they're more hawkish than fucking right wingers are on, on national security just uh, i don't know if it's performative or they're trying to just like burnish their bona fides or whatever but it's yeah you're right in that like that is a significant problem that probably will take time to spin its way out although like i honestly don't know where the liberal political class really ends up. I mean, it's kind of hard to say because it's such a nebulous term. And really, I think at its heart, it really just means that core class of grifters that are able to kind of insert themselves into the existing structure and yeah. kind of work as its uh, blood and uh, tendons and all that grisly shit underneath the skin. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, who knows? It's, it's, just, it's just a weird ideology in general. And it, 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 you know, we have that CIA ad. I heard you guys take on that. I thought that yeah. was brilliant, but it's like, that like the, what that woman was saying was like a poem that I would have read in university like 15 years ago. Yeah, and it's a little it's a little fucked up to me to have like poetry itself being turned into the mechanism by which the world is turned into like a slightly worse place. Yeah. Week in, week out. Well, the problem with liberalism is that it's not really an ideology. Um, I mean, to the extent that it is an ideology, it's it's in, there's like very few people who are um, kind of principled liberals they're just like they just don't exist you know really mm -hmm. um they really are a a kind of um a sensibility really than anything else i mean like th one of the reasons why glenn greenwald makes them so angry is because glenn greenwald is a principled liberal like glenn greenwald is not on the left like he's not a marxist socialist he's not that those things he is really kind of like an, a 1970s liberal um totally. yeah he's kind of like would have 
would have looked totally not out of place in like the Watergate era for sure. So of course, one hundred percent. He would have been fine. Like he would have worked for Frank Church on the Church Committee easily. Um, and you know, to the Glenn Greenwald is just like too stupid to to take all that shit seriously, and you know, and, and not realize that it's all bullshit. Um, and um, you know, and I respect him greatly. I really do. Um, but he's one of the he's one of the few people who actually take liberalism seriously because the liberals themselves don't even take it seriously they really don't like they they change they change with whatever the fuck's like in the wind um they maintain zero principles um and and that's what it is it's it's really just some sort of it's really like a rhetorical pose a sensibility it's really a um a shock absorber from for for left-wing kind of uh discontentness Mm -hmm. for lack of a better term um and a kind of you know, safety valve, uh, a pressure valve for, for capital. I mean, that's like really what it is at its, at its core. It's not really an ideology. There's no like, there's no like foundational text of liberalism. I mean, I mean they might, they, well, they might I mean, they, tell you that. They emphasize certain common sense, uh, you know, inherent human attributes, things like, you know, fairness and compromise. And they somehow transmogrify those into some kind of ideological principle. It's like, yeah, compromise isn't a fucking ideological principle. It's just something that happens in life. So right, but I mean, it, it's the it's the joke. Like, I mean, do you compromise? Like, you know, the liberals, like uh, in nineteen, you know, thirty three, would have been like, well, you know, uh, you know, actually exterminating six million Jews, Mister Hitler, is just is a is a bridge too far. Let's do <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, exactly. like here's a question. There's though. no inherent there's no inherent goodness to compromise. There's just no. Yeah. It's depending on what. Like, what are your political goals? They don't have any. They have no ideological goals, like they have no principles. It's really just kind of a, which is why for the the vast majority of uh, American history, very few Americans have ever called themselves liberals um, because because there's there's no libidinal appeal to that. Um, There is no kind of, yeah. You're going exactly where I wanted to go with this. So, I mean, yeah, for a short period of time, and it was, it was, Plink and he missed it. In like the 70s, it was sexy to be called a liberal. Liberals were sexy because they were tolerant. They didn't mind if you were getting on with your freaky hippie jam in the back of the van with Peter, Paul, and Mary or whatever the fuck. Obviously, that age is long dead. There's nothing fucking sexy about Amy Klobuchar or uh, fucking Chuck Schumer, whoever the fuck else, right? But I'm asking for a friend. Is the age of the sexy socialist about to begin? Or has it already begun? I would hope. I mean, um, there there is, uh, you know, one of the great innovations that ja- that Bhaskar Sankara did at Jacobin is that he was always very committed from day one to making the magazine like look amazing. You know, um, obviously the content within it is 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 great, and um, but he was very he very well understood that if you're on the left and you're a critic of the uh, established order and you look like shit. <laughs> you know, you're already kind of like you're owning uh, yourself know, because you, you're, you have everything right against you. I'm wearing you know? a plaid shirt. I know you look great, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, like the sort of cliche of like that bearded guy with like mm. you know who smelled like shit wearing Birkenstocks, going like, "Hey, man, it's the corporations, man." You know, yeah. like um, who's more right about the world than you know Thomas Friedman or whatever? Um, mm. But like, well, he's well, so that, there's a long, there's a, that's a long list of people that are more right about the world than Thomas Friedman. That's true, but yeah. Um, like other people have gone beyond the hotel like buffet yeah but it's interesting what you say about the 1970s liberal being sexy and you're right i mean like you know um dustin hoffman was a leading man in marathon man he he plays you know an academic <laughs> like a phd his student in history um and <clears throat> you know all the president's men and shit um but it's because they were um they had reached a certain level of hegemony, which was thanks to the victories of, of the New Deal era. You know, they really did transform American society for the better. Obviously, the victories of the New Deal era are thanks to the left, and that's been suppressed and erased, but but it's it's because it was like the end point of that. So, so it was kind of like the echo, the echo of that mystique. Or it wasn't even an echo at that point. It was actually just recent history, really. Yeah, it was the facts yeah. on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're saying socialists have to get power before they're going to be truly sexy? Well, uh, I don't know. I mean, the left has all kinds of like awful pathologies that are um, left over from our time. 
so far in so so long in the wilderness right i mean sure. um uh i don't know i don't know if you've if you've read or I don't, isn't even out yet ben burgess's latest book i read it like an advanced copy oh no right. i mean like I, yeah, uh, I know exactly where you're going yeah like i mean he 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 very accurately and very lovingly and not like in uh you know, not like in a post left situation kind of describes and, and, and categorizes all the pathologies uh, on, on the left that are really just kind of stylistic, strategic, tactical, they're not, the left is correct in its arguments about history, about capitalism, about class, all that shit. But we're too annoying. <laughs> we just gotta stop being so fucking annoying. You know, like, um, because we haven't built a mass base in forever. We have like, we've lost that muscle. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so, so yeah, we do have to make it sexy again. We do have to make, we do have to give it like a certain libidinal appeal. We do have to, you know, all that shit's important. I mean, it's, 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 everything else is against you. You know, the entire power structure is against you. So, you know, you're we're better. We, we might as well, like if we're not going to make it look good and fun and exciting and um you know like part of like a team you know part of like all that shit that makes you know that makes attaching yourself to a cause that is greater than yourself so exciting you know and 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 gives your life purpose and meaning and all that shit uh if you're not if you're gonna suck all the fun out of that mm. then you're shooting yourself in the foot like it should be fun it should be should make you feel like you're 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 doing something real like you're not like just kind of um you know being told that you've already participated in rape culture by you know uh being cisgender or whatever or, well if you're, or, if you're trying you to know. emancipate yourself into another world the, the world you emancipate to should be more fun than the one you left like otherwise like what's the fucking point of breaking free well, what's the point yeah you know yeah so yeah and it should be a better a more a more robust form of fun than you know just playing uh board games on like saturday night twice a month which is kind of i think the that sounds model that sounds like something you do no not at all it sounds like a very specific thing <laughs> board games on saturday but, uh, night twice a those month those around me those around yeah. me yeah yeah um yeah now i wanted to ask you as well are you still doing the entourage podcast uh we took a small break uh break. my co-host miguel uh got too busy this is this was like mm -hmm. a very much a quarantine project in which both of us were unemployed um we've both since been employed and our time uh constraint was just too great especially his mm -hmm. um but uh i'm trying to bring it back with a new co-host uh that awesome. i'm working on on getting it back so that would be fun because we won't you know we, we stopped in season two and there's plenty of seasons left so like what why, why would you just say just for the audience like that entourage is one of the most significant cultural products of uh, the last century just give me, well, give me the heart so well the 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 crazy thing to think about is that entourage was first of all a huge hit but also critically acclaimed um in its time like even a lot of these woke reviewers who would be horrified today by a lot of this shit um, were all over it. Like Alan Sepinwall, like wrote like a, you know, series of glowing reviews and shit like that. Um, it was critically acclaimed and won awards. <laughs> it was like seen as this biting uh, satire of, of Hollywood. But to me, what it is, is also just a fascinating window into pre-2008 culture. You know, the financial, crisis, the financial crisis really changed culture in so many ways. Um, and one of them is that before 2008, this, the, the, the sort of naked celebration of wealth, you know, for its own purposes, the, the sort of gaudy show-offiness uh, show of it, you know, like, oh, look, check out my, like, silver-plated Hummer uh, and shit, you know, that, like... That was that was so dominant at the time when you know American capitalism was really roaring in so, in so many ways. I mean, it was those were the glory days where you know people were buying fucking twelve bedroom houses for three hundred thousand dollars, like on the outskirts of Phoenix. Um, and uh, obviously, it was all built in a house of cards, and it came crashing down. Um, and since then, you know, you just don't really see that as much. You see certain shows like Billions or whatever that show the uber 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 one percent obscene uh kind of 
privilege wealth and shit but it's it is very much uh seen as a critique of it like i i see billions as like these people are not celebrated really i mean i'm sure some people like kind of read it and we're like oh man i want to be bobby axelrod or whatever but yeah. the um, wealth isn't, it isn't affirmed in the same way no and these guys in entourage were just fucking guys like they're just like you know they're not plutocrats um and they were just some fucking guys and one of them was a decent actor uh, in in well in the in the firmament of the show because he's actually a terrible mm -hmm. actor in real life uh and that's one of the things we always talk about yeah i remember you guys saying that is that it's just like the, the acting has gotten so much better <laughs> in tv than it was back then i mean tv back then this was like early 2000s so like the sopranos had just come out um with, you know sopranos changed tv obviously um ushered in the era of prestige tv and it was mm -hmm. like it's become much more common for the top tier actors to be in tv back then if you were in tv you were stuck in tv forever and you were stuck doing like you know 28 episodes of some firefighter you know like boston fire department show and like you know doing that for 12 years uh yeah. of your life um so Sometimes. yeah it's very apparent so wait do you have a co-host i mean again i'm asking for a friend no i have one i just i just uh we, we we've been prepping to bring it back he just needs a little awesome. he just needs a little time yeah no, i'm so, glad because I, I was really digging it a lot like i mean, we kind of do that a little bit on this show too like i because I, I do think tv shows especially from the recent past are very much a window into the culture of that time and it's really interesting to look at the differences because they're really apparent now even yeah. 10 20 years ago on something um or 20 30 years Whereas like when you watched it originally, you know, you obviously you're living in the, you don't yet know the future. So, you know, it was just law and order back then. Whereas now it's this kind of like cultural time capsule. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, and then honestly, like, it's just, well, first of all, it's also just like, it's crazy to see. I mean, you know, I wouldn't consider myself like one of these like annoying uh, woke people, but um, it is crazy to see just how, how much the center of gravity has shifted and you know even to someone like myself like some of the shit on entourage you're like ooh, <laughs> you know like that's like you know that's like horribly sexist <laughs> you know something that i would never say about any tv show now um because like it's just not allowed uh but back then this was seen as like the cutting edge uh of of tv and like you just see just how much the the culture has changed i mean it's just it's remarkable i mean i remember it i mean i wasn't that young uh, when Entourage was was in its heyday, uh, everything from the clothes to the everything is just so different. It just, you know, there one of the defining things of our time is that it feels like nothing ever changes. Um, and there's some element of truth to that because politically nothing changes. Like there's been no major kind of policy advancement that helps regular people um, yeah. in 40 years. You yeah. know, really. Um, so. Uh, so that there's a feeling that nothing ever changes. Uh, but when you when you see something like Entourage, you see that the sort of liberal cultural sensibility has become totally hegemonic in a way that it wasn't. It just wasn't. Um, it just like really wasn't back then. And, and that's like a significant change that liberals have colonized culture and have completely dominated it. Um, and their particular sensibility, their sort of incredibly college uh you know driven by their college education i would argue mm -hmm. yeah um, for sure has just infect like all of culture mm -hmm. on every level mm -hmm. um it's kind of interesting yeah i mean and i'd be fine with like that that influence being there but the monocultural aspect of it is really troubling it's it boring does, yeah it's super boring there's a there's a guy from Miami. There's a, a film director from Miami named S. Craig Zoller, who is a total reactionary right winger. But his movies, when you watch them, are very good. Um, he's obviously like a very you know, uh, I don't know if you know who he is, but he's he he did a movie called Bone Tomahawk. He did a movie called Dragged Across Con Concrete, and he did another movie about like a prisoner, and I forgot the name of it. It's like takes him in the prison. All of them are like right wing fucking you know reactionary as fuck but there's they're interesting and they're uh they feel edgy in a way because he's so clearly positioned against the hegemonic culture of our time it's in a way the same reason why something like bonnie and clyde felt so uh, subversive in 1967 or whatever mm -hmm. when the culture at the time was very dominated by like kind of just very cheesy right-wing uh westerns mm -hmm. and and you know cop shows and things like that um mm -hmm. 
when this kind of, you know, when this other thing came out, it felt so subversive. And like the sad reality is that now, because this kind of anodyne liberalism has become so dominant in our culture, something, you know, as Craig Zoller's movies do feel provocative in a way. Um, well, I mean, I know, think, they're still I worth think, watching, but yeah. yeah. I think I think an intelligent, even like right wing person, I mean, obviously let's not go too far right wing in that equation. No, I yeah. mean, cinema itself is about showing you the world from someone's perspective. And it works best when that perspective is perhaps outside an outsider perspective in some way. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a prison yeah. film is a great example of that, but really like any good movie, if it's doing its job, it's showing you the world through someone's shoes that you wouldn't normally understand or look through. And maybe, and just by nature, that's why like movies about serial killers, for example, work because it's like, I don't want to cheer for the serial killer. I don't like serial killers, but the, it's about him. So inevitably, yeah. I have uh, inevitably, I'm going to be drawn to looking at things from their perspective. Yeah. Um, so no, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm I mean, down with like as long as as long as they're not you know in the streets with a tiki torch screaming, Jews will not replace us. I'm down with no, like, no, no. It's not like that. It makes a good movie. You know? Obviously, <laughs> yeah. And then the, and the, the the other annoying thing is that liberals have because they're politically inert. You know, right? They they they, they have no political program worth speaking of. They have infused culture uh like or not infused they have turned culture into politics mm. and culture and politics are related but they not they are not politics they're mm. culture it's mm. there's intersections here and there and things like that but like there is something to the right wing critic like complaint that like oh the libs you know like they want to make you know they want to make my football about about politics mm -hmm. you know not realizing that football is about politics but like not in the way the liberals see it um mm -hmm. and they have replaced a political program with cultural taste and so like i can tell you who you voted for by the by the by the shows that you want like if you watch mm -hmm. broad city and you know insecure and mm -hmm. You know, you listen to um, uh, whatever the fuck. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I can predict. I can predict like almost to a T who 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 you voted for. Yeah. Um, and they have made every single utterance within a movie a um, moral and political question. And yeah, that's just I think not the, the moralism is what really bothers me because it's like yeah. these people who came. They came from this moral wasteland where they divorced themselves from let's face it, like all economic policy that is handed over the keys to the companies and said, you run the show as you see fit. We're going to manage yeah. the, we're going to manage the masses and just kind of like keep it pretty around the edges. Meanwhile, after pulling that fucking shit, they come in here and say, well, I know what's moral and right. I'm going to tell you a story that will illustrate to you how I know yeah. what's moral and right. And it's obviously extremely patronizing and just patently ridiculous on its Did face. you watch Promising Young Women? Woman? No, I haven't seen it yet. Okay. Yeah. But it's like, okay, so know, Promising Young Women, which one best uh, screenplay uh, at the Academy Awards. Mm -hmm. um, Promising Young Woman is the, le is the most on the nose, least subtle. It's like, we're trying to do a message here, okay? Mm -hmm. And every scene is like the message, man. This is the message. I'm like, you gotta, you see, we're doing a message here. Like, there's yeah. no subtlety to it. There's no there it's all just right on the surface and they just tell you like there is no you know there's no work to be done as a viewer also the movie sucks and it's just yeah. boring but um you know it, like i just found it interesting that it was celebrated as this brilliant mm. kind of satire when it's just it's just not a satire it's just the thing they just tell you they just outright mm. tell you what it's about in every fucking scene um and you know i just i don't know i just don't want to live in that kind of world where the culture oh, no, it's, is it's, just that it's, it's just apocalyptic a, yeah i mean that's yeah. not even culture it's 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 propaganda and it's it's and it's the antithesis of what art is supposed to be which is dealing with complexity and subtlety and things yes. under the surface and things underground and the singularity and taboos, of voices, what and, me, taboos and and the, the differences in social in, in, in different social groups and individuals and if you're just if you're just preaching to someone that's one voice you're maintaining throughout the entire thing, where something like a movie or a novel should have a multitude of voices. Yeah. And a lot of well, different I mean, things it's, going it's on. interesting that like, but they're trying to kill that, right? Like they're, they're, yeah, they're saying a problem like, for them because they, they can't sit on their moral right. fucking perched little tower. Right. I don't know. Maybe but like, they just even, have nothing else mean, to do. It's the point of ridiculousness where they're like, you know, if you're, if you're uh, Hispanic and you write a black character, you're, you're doing a racism, you know? 
Um, that's like that is like a critic. That is like a, that is part of the liberal critique of culture these days. Like if you're like if Jonathan Franzen, you know, were to write a black character um, and like have him which is, speaking which is in not black vernacular. Say, like, which is not to say that even if that was not criticized, that it wouldn't still be problematic in a lot of cases, right? Like, it's like, there's no nuance here. It's all or nothing is the right. problem. Yeah, right. I know, and, and, and this, rep, like I call it representationalism because I do view it as an ideology, which just says, literally we just need the right diversity of people in the spots. Right. Fuck, fuck the economy, fuck politics, fuck power. Fuck like what, what the world was when you woke up this morning. If we just have, if we can check off the diversity boxes, that alone, completely yeah. divorced of any other action is going to make the world is going to fix all our problems not yeah. just going to make the world a little bit of a better place by inspiring people like that's literally in and of itself going to somehow magically make everything better which is just yeah. a shocking reductionist take on like like not only history but just human nature itself and yeah the fact that like really by doing that you're ultimately actually limiting people's potentialities in a lot of ways too yeah, you know, because you're making them hyper aware of it. It becomes their currency. We're living in this atomized world where everyone's got to work their own brand and they realize, well, fuck, if I can get some purchase with this shit, I'd be crazy not to. Well, not just that, but I mean, it's it's even more insidious than that because it's like if you are a black guy or a Hispanic guy or a gay guy or whatever, insert, you know, oppressed minority, you know, here uh, and you're willing to do the evil shit, you know, you're willing to turn around and then like, you know, be the CEO of, of Exxon Mobil, <laughs> you know, which is like, you know, to do the, if you're willing to do it, most people aren't, most people are, you know, moral, uh, you know, have kind of ethics mm. and, and morals that are, you know, people don't give them credit for, but if you're just the guy who's willing to do it, you're going to rise to the top, like very quickly. Um, and people, those incentives, which are warped, um, are very real, you know, like if you're, if you're willing to be Lloyd Austin, um, and be the black guy who becomes secretary of defense, um, and then just, you know, kind of obliterates the Middle East uh, every day, you know, then, yeah, you're going to rise up to the top. Okay, it's come full circle. I know we're near the end when I start to get to when we arrive at a very depressing thought. So that's good. <laughs> um, I will say we'll start the wind down procedure. I'll say Club 11 in Miami. Please yeah. hire me. Uh, the intro song today is from the Hotline Miami original soundtrack and our outro will be the Italian version of Pocket Calculator by Kraftwerk. Because I do wow. know Spanish and Italian are mutually intelligible. Um, that, that is true. And wow, uh, you you know a lot about music. A little bit. Um, to be honest, no, I'm I'm still catching up. I really have a, the algorithm to thank and a lot of a lot of free time. Um, but uh, please, <laughs> everyone should like and subscribe. Whether you're on YouTube or not, we're we're on um, Patreon at Patreon.com/slash Night Rule. We got bonus episodes and mixtapes up there for the patrons. Um, Nando, mixtapes of like your you? cool music taste. Kind of. I mean, I'm just waiting for my MA from DC University, the so-called DCMA, mm. to come through, and then I'll have to stop producing them. But um, nice. I'll share the folder with you. I share it with uh, with guests as well. But um, nice. Yeah, I actually got a new patron for the hockey podcast. A new hockey podcast called H Handkerchief Dynasty. So if there's any Edmonton Oilers fans out there that want a Bolshevik take on uh, on your Edmonton Oilers news, please check us out. That's actually quite popular. I'm ashamed. Hell yeah. Yeah um but uh yeah we'll give you the final word what uh what should people uh, be looking forward to that you're looking at in this next little while here nando Oof. you know just uh i don't know man you well, know you're gonna like have a, a, a jacobin spring calendar the the, the, the babes and, and bros and yeah jacobin. the babes of jacobin is coming out yeah um the yeah basker's been working on that one don't worry don't you worry uh it's gonna it's gonna make more. It's gonna be like the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, where like the, the entire magazine was uh, subsidized by that one issue a year. Um, right, finally, some 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 pornography I can feel good about jacking off to. That's great. There you go. <laughs> it, hasn't, it hasn't occurred yet. So there you go. Um, yeah. No, just you know, weekends at Jacobin every Saturday and Woke Bros every Thursday. Those are the two yeah. main things. And be stay tuned for the return of the Entourage Pod. Let's pot it out. I hope to I hope to fire it up very soon. Yeah, I'm sure people know about your uh, Jacobin weekends, which is great. Love Anna, obviously, fantastic uh, work. She always uh, she's always doing yeah. great stuff. And then, uh, but Woke Bros is on the Black B O M M feed, right? Black Opinions yes, Matter. Yes, the bomb feed. Yep. Bomb feed. So check it out there. There's a lot of other good stuff on there too. Um, listen, Nando, you're a prince for coming on. Really a pleasure meeting. Thanks for having pleasure me. Conversing. Um, love Absolutely. to talk again sometime. You take care. I'm sure you will be a media mogul in actuality and not just in my imagination within the week. Or let's give it seven to ten days max. Um, and yeah, just enjoy the rest of your night and take care. So great talking. You too, brother. 
All right, man. man. Take it easy. Bye. Later.